Chapter 10, The Adventure of the Forest of Burdens Through the days and the years of the Forest of Burdens was like a shadow upon the course of the splendid way. Sir Constant had seen it from the casement of the Chapel of Voices, and every day thereafter had revealed it anew, a mystery and a menace. In the windings of the Valley of Toil, it was a cloud that stretched to the utmost range of sight, and in the Pass of Tears it mingled its gloomy branches with the pines that hid the warden's castle. When the way climbed through sunny uplands, the shadow fell back a while, and there were days when there were some hints of beauty in the dark colors that mingled with the evening clouds and the sunset sky. But never did it vanish with the rising of the sun, never did its long line break to reveal a glory beyond. And oft the forest grew so close to the path that the splendid way was but a slender thread through the silent aisles. Sir Constant knew that this was one of the mysteries of the way, and that in the king's good time the light must shine upon it. But often his journey was overcast by the spell of mystery and shadow and silence. So it was on that last day when sunset found him alone upon the path with no house of rest at hand. And with the forest close upon him, he had deemed that the end of the journey must be near and had looked to see the way leave these devious windings to mount the last range of hills. But still the winding way, still the stony path and narrow, still the screen, a strange and darksome forest. Now he came suddenly to a parting of ways, for a track came out of the forest and crossed his path. To be lost again in the forest on the other side it was not his purpose to follow this path. But he wondered who had gone that way to so much gloom and care. And while he wondered there came a ring of hoofs and bridle chains, in a night with two squires came riding up behind him. The knight wore the arms of the great service, and when he saw Sir Constant, he drew rein and saluted him graciously. I see the arms of the service, he said, and its emblem is very dear to me. I beg you your name, Sir Knight. Sir Constant told him, liking his manner well, and the knight, whose name was Sir Pladio, turned with great joy to his squires. Mark this, he cried. Here we have the good hap to meet Sir Constant, the conqueror of the false Sir Joyous, and the champion of the wood of the House of Hate. And again he turned to Sir Constant. Well, it was that we found you, he said. For now we may serve you for the last stage of your journey. Beyond this forest lies the last green hill, and over the hill goes the splendid way, splendid indeed at last, to the very gate to the city royal. And we have a horse, so that the end of your long quest may be with ease and honor. Then the squires came forward, and between them was a noble charger, richly decked, all its trappings bearing the royal emblem. It was a glorious gift, and our knight's heart warmed at the sight. Truly do I give you thanks, he cried. Is it the king's will that I ride with you? Not with us, said the knight. It is not our lot to reach the city so soon, but it is ours to serve the knight victorious, and to speed him on his way. Now the heart of Sir Constant was uplifted, for he was weary with journeys and battles, and age had come upon him, so that there was 
other lines upon his face than those of scars. Nor did he doubt that this gift was good, for he still held faithfully to the splendid way. But ere he could accept it, there came a sound of hard breathing and a moaning, and out into the open space came a man stumbling heavily beneath a burden almost beyond his strength to bear. He was a peasant, and old, but above all was the pain of his burden, for the sweat ran from his face and his brows were wrung with anguish. He came out of the forest and made as if to enter it on the other side. He saw the knights, but scarcely heeded them, and would have passed on, but Sir Constant went to him and laid his hand upon him kindly, and lifted the burden from his back. Stay, friend, he said. Is there any need of such haste? Surely there is time for rest. The man stood and straightened himself and looked dully upon them. There is haste, he said sullenly. The tribute is due, and where shall I find rest? But Sir Constant made him sit down upon the grass beside his burden and gave him drink from his own flask. And while Sir Plodio and his squires looked on in, in impatient wonder, he questioned him further. And the man, a little refreshed, spoke more gently. All who dwell in this forest, and they are many, must pay a tribute to their lord, the lord of the forest. And this tribute is to bear a certain weight of silver from his silver mines afar off and deliver it at his castle. This is the law of the forest, which through this law is called the forest of burdens, and there is none that may escape it. I have been to the mines, and here is my burden, but the way is heavy, and the burden more than I can bear. Yet bear it I must, for it is the law. Then again he looked sullenly at the knights and sullenly at his burden. But Constance spoke aside to Sir Plodio. My heart speaks for this man. The terror of this place is great, and he must bear it alone. But Sir Plodio answered gravely, Is not his lot appointed? Can any man change it? Or should he do it if he had the power? Doubtless some sore rebellion hath brought in this law, now so irksome. I doubt if we may put a hand to it. Sir Constant heard, but his heart grew still heavier for the pain of the burden-bearer. And the man looked sullenly upon them as they talked. Moreover, said Sir Plodio, if this is the king's appointment, as it may be, how shall his servants even question it? It is surely not their place as loyal servants. They have other quests, and ever the king's business requires haste. Is it not so? It seems so, said Sir Constant, and yet my heart misgives me for this man. How can I see him fall beneath his load? And Sir Plodio said again, gravely, Consider well, lest your good heart even now lead you from the way. Have you done so meaningly that this may not be left to others? The peril of Sir Joyous, in the house of hate, in the city dangerous, in the misty sea. Are not these enough for you to show? Come, I pray, ere the day be spent, and leave this man to his own task. Aye, said the man, hearing, it is mine, and I ask no man to share it. And he rose from the ground. But still Sir Constant pondered, while Sir Palladio 
and his squires waited upon his word. The shadows of the forest darkened upon the way, and one lonely star came forth in the evening sky. Then Sir Constant laid his hand upon his brow, burdened and bewildered. But as he did, so he remembered what Sir Fortis had told him long ago in the Chapel of Voices, how that he must ever seek and follow the vision of the face. At this thought he looked up, and lo, that lonely star, shining faintly down upon him between the leaves from a darkening sky. To him it was like the star of the Chapel of Voices, and once more the glory of the vision was upon him, as wondrous in power as on that night of vigil. Its splendor overwhelmed him, but more than the splendor was the love of the marvelous countenance, the compassion of those yearning eyes. As it burst upon him, his heart swelled in joyous answer, and his course was taken. He turned again to Sir Plotio. It must be so, he said. I must share his burden with him. But Sir Plotio's face darkened. Is that your resolve? He asked sternly. It is my resolve. I must aid him. I must aid him, even if I never reach the city royal. Sir Plotio looked upon him steadily and saw that his heart was set. So suddenly the knight reined back his horse and turned him and rode away. The squires turned also and followed their master, leading, taking the lead horse with them. There was no gentle courtesy, no word of farewell, but a murmuring of wrath and a sound of laughter and a ringing of bridal chains that soon died away in the forest distances. But Sir Constant spoke to the man of the forest. Not alone shall you go, he said. I will help you to the end of your journey. It is my burden, said the peasant, and I ask no man to share it. No, said Sir Constant, but there is a constraint upon me. Let us go. They took the burden together and entered the forest. And at once the last of the day was gone, and they were in a world of swiftly deepening shadow. But ere they had gone many paces, the man said, Knew you well that knight who rode away so roughly? He seemed no friend of yours. No, said Sir Constant. It was then that I saw him first. But he was a good knight, friendly and courteous. It may be so, said the man. I know little of things that are not my concern. But for all his fair words, he was at heart no friend of yours. When you didst watch that star, I saw that he eyed you fiercely and laid his hand upon his sword. Yet secretly was it done, as though he feared to test you in open fight. When I saw this, I knew who he might be. What is this strange saying? cried Sir Constant. I pray you tell me all. He must be that strong champion called the Black Knight, answered the peasant. In his true form, he wears black armor with a leopard upon his shield, but he is seldom seen in his true form, for he is a sorcerer knight, as renowned for his subtlety in disguise as for his skill and strength in battle. It must be that he has tried you ere this and found you more than his match. Then was Sir Constant sore at heart for the snare that he had barely escaped, 
but the sorrow was covered by his joy in the vision that had saved him. If this is true, he said, I am indeed sore beset. Great is my dread of this treacherous foe. Ever has he been my bane. No, said the peasant, with scorn in his voice. Have no dread now, for he will trouble you no more. The champion indeed lies in wait at the entrance to this forest. But never has he followed any knight far within its tangled paths. These dark and toilsome ways, I trow, are little to his liking. So they went on. Nowhere in all the world shall a traveler find a region more delorious than the forest of burdens, save only the pass of tears. Even at high noon, the light was faint and pale, and the shadows gathered grimly long before the sun had sunk in the west. Its ancient trees lifted tortured arms to see an unseen sky, and never was a maze more perplexing than that of its tangled undergrowth and its dense and thorny thickets. Nor was there any plain path. Each must make his own path, said the man of the forest. There is no clean highway. By long use we learn a little, and so go from place to place. But all the ways bring us at last, they say, to the forest of our stern lord, Sir Justice. And have you seen him? asked Sir Constant. Why should I wish to see him? said the man. Is it not enough for me, his tribute and his forest? Little desire have I to see his face. They went into the shadowed maze, bearing the burden together, but the man leading. The path was full of ruts and overhang by brambles, so that from, fir from the first the way was a broken and labored way. Soon dead darkness gathered round them, in deep silence, save for their own stumbling footsteps, and hard breathing, and few halting words. And soon the man fell, for he was old and feeble, so that presently constant with the burden himself, and laid it upon his own shoulder. It is my lot, said the man, still sullenly, and I ask no man to bear it. But since Sir Constance said no word in answer, he fell silent. It took the knight by the hand and led him on. As they went deeper, the path grew still more troublous. Now with thorns and brambles, now with ruts and mire, and ever the burden grew more weighty, so that even the great strength of our knight was little enough. In a while the sweat was in his eyes, but he strengthened his heart with the thought that if he had not come, the old man must have fallen by the way. And then came the memory of the vision of the face, and he saw that he could do no other. Yet in no battle had he been more sorely beset, and never were thorns like the thorns of this dread forest, for they had no pity. They tore his hands despite his gauntlets, and they pierced his feet through his stout shoes of leather. Nor was this all, for when he could not save himself because of his burden, they clung to his helm and scarred his brows. So keen was the pang that he groaned in his heart and would have groaned aloud, but that he would not, be, not trouble the peasant by the knowledge of his hurt. But the peasant knew something of his trouble. It was filled with wonder. 
Oh, my good Lord, he said at last, the burden is mine, and I cannot ask any man to bear it for me. Surely you have done enough. Now, therefore, let it lie in the path and return to your way. What man shall do so much for another and a stranger? But Constant said, Lead on. They came now to the thickest of the forest, where the darkness was deep indeed, and the path a very pit, and the light of day as far away as if it had never been. Again the man fell, and would scarce have raised himself had it not been that Constant was with him. And twice Sir Constant sank to his knees, and would have been hard put to it to recover himself, but for the presence of that man's misery. And one more thought of the vision of the face. So he rose and staggered on, and as they came clear of the pit, he knew another wonder of the forest of burdens. Sad and dark and dread might the forest be, but it was easier for him because he helped another. In his own pity lay some source of power. In the touch of this helpless one, some deep secret of comfort. Thus it was that in a while they came out of their dire distress and were making better way. Then the peasant said in wonder, There is the light. Surely I see a light upon the path. One has walked here before us and has left a light in every footprint for those who follow him. Now this seemed to be but a dream of the old man. But if it were a dream, it cheered his heart. So from that moment he walked more strongly himself and led Sir Constant with better spirit. Anon, he said joyfully, that the light remained in the path, though he could see no man, and truly it seemed to be so. For soon they found a beaten way and saw before them a light at a castle gate, a gate ancient and moss-grown with frowning battlements above. It was the fortress of the forest where the burden must be delivered. It was about this time that Constant noticed a strange, sweet odor as of flowers and called to mind the odor of the flowers of mortal, whose fragrant blossoms which he had seen in the garden of the great king. Do you see flowers at our feet? he asked. And the peasant answered again. The footprints before us leave a light, but this is a thing almost as marvelous. Wherever your foot has marked the earth, there springs up a lily like a star, white as snow and rich with perfume. Then they came to the gate of the fortress, where he found a bell and rang it, and immediately the servants of the castle came and took the burden and led them in. The lord of the forest of burdens sat in the great hall of the castle, with his servitors at hand and his steward at the table before him. Sir Justice was an aged knight with stern and graven face and with the eye of judgment. He wore as it were a crown, but it was of iron, and its only beauty was one pale jewel, clear but cold and luster. On the table lay a sword unsheathed, so great that few men might wield it, but so mighty a man was Sir Justice that it seemed not too great for him. Then the servitors weighed the silver, and the steward took account of it. While they did this, Sir Constant marked a symbol carved upon the wall behind the seat of the lord of the castle. It was a symbol of a pair of balances, of which 
one had been heavily weighted in the other light indeed but in the lighter vessel of the balances lay across the emblem of the great king as those set in the scales to restore the balance but while he wondered at this sign the steward said to his lord it is the law that the people of the forest shall pay this tribute of a burden this man could not pay for the task was too great for him. Is it according to the law that he go free? Then said the lord of the castle sternly, The tribute is paid, for the silver is here. How comes it here if he could not pay it? And the peasant cried upon his knees, It was my burden, and I asked no man to share it with me. But this man came and took it from me, and delivered it at the gate. In that the tribute is paid, I claim my quittance. Then said Sir Justice, My question is good, Master Steward, and the answer is good also, for there is one law greater than the law of the forest, and that is the law of the pierced hands and feet and the bleeding brows. I see that with these signs this man has paid the tribute for his brother and has set him free. Therefore shall you make out the quittance. Then the steward at the table wrote, and while he wrote, the lord of the castle said to Sir Constant, In your heart you do challenge the law of the forest for its harshness and its mystery. The law is indeed a mystery a mystery of pain and tears and sorrow since the long-forgotten beginnings. But it is not a mystery of mine. These were a hard and rebellious people, and it may be that they brought the law upon themselves. But I hold to my duty, knowing that in the king's good time the mystery shall be unveiled. Meanwhile, I see this wonder daily, as surely as the sun rises in the heavens, that the new land of the pierced hands and feet and the bleeding brow does conquer the old law of the forest and disarm the rage of a rebellion and win for the king the heart so hard that no other power may win it. These things shall you see also ere the day is done. Then he sealed the quittance with his signet ring, which bore the emblem of a sword upon which a cross had been laid. And when the peasant had taken the quittance and laid it in his bosom, he took Sir Constant by the hand to lead him from that place of strange symbols, that castle of ancient strength. Nor was Constant unwilling to go, for there was little cheer in that stern hall with its bared sword and silent servitors, and its austere lord with a crown of iron. So in a little while they reached the pe peasant's cottage. There they found his wife and children, who gave them a glad welcome, and whose joy in the quittance was good indeed to see. Then the man brought water, and relieved Sir Constant of his armor, and washed his hands and feet and his brows. Now at last he saw how his helper had been torn by the thorns of the forest, and his face became troubled. Long he gazed at those wounds, and suddenly he broke into tears and gently kissed the marks and cried, These wounds were for me. Then he stood before the emblem of the gallant's shield, and said, This is the sign of the king who sent you. By your deed I know that he is love, despite the pain and mystery of this forest. So let me be his man forever. And Sir Constant and the woman and children saw it in wonder, for he was of a sullen spirit. The sight of those wounds had touched his heart as nothing else had touched it 
through all the days of his life. After this, they set supper before the two who had come through the forest. And it was a supper of bread and wine. And as they supped, Sir Constant remembered the day long ago when he had taken bread and wine with Sir Fortis in the Chapel of Voices. It had seemed to him that one another had been present at the feast. And now it was the same. Through the dark and silent forest he came, leaving a light in every footprint. The door of the cottage opened at his touch, and he came in, and sat at the table between the night with the marked hands and the man whose burden had been shared. With silent lips he sat, but his eyes spoke the things that could not be spoken. When the supper was done, Sir Constant went to his rest. But before he rested, he pondered a while how far he might have wandered from the splendid way and how he might return to it. Yet he felt that the adventure of the forest, he could not be far from the king's will. Surely, he said, Sir Fortis told me that the vision must ever be my guide, and I saw it when I entered the forest. Therefore, in the morning, I shall see the way once more. In a little while, he lay down to sleep, fearing that the terror of the forest might oppress him in his dreams. But it was not so, for he dreamed of Sir Valorous and Sir Fortis and Sir Felix, who smiled upon him and crossed the gulf of years and took him by the hand. And in his sleep he greeted them with joy. So the night sped on a fair awakening. In the morning, a faint and sweet from afar came the music of bells. They were bells that spoke praise and comfort and gracious memories. But ever and anon came a deeper, stronger note, as though some dread battle of long ago, crowned with victory, had been wrought into one rich tone of solemn joy. From the place where Constant stood, he saw a vision of soaring pinnacles, all radiant in sunshine, the pinnacles of a great city. But everywhere the temples and homes of the city were set in gardens, so that lordly trees rose on all sides to those shining towers, and the air was filled with a perfume of many flowers in bloom. On one side there was a sea, heaving under a gentle breeze and as blue as the unclouded sky above it. The place where he stood was itself a garden, and he deemed that it might be the garden of the gate by which he had entered the city. But when he turned to see, there was neither gate nor wall. Then in his heart he mused, it must be that the city lay on the farther side of the forest. But the man of the forest said nothing of it. There were streets in the city, and he saw people pass to and fro. And there was a sound of laughter and a murmuring that might be the murmuring of toil. But it was toil without sorrow or pain. And in the walk of the people there was neither sadness nor labor, but a joy that cannot be described. This joy was the air of the city, as though it hovered and brooded over the pinnacles of, in gardens. As for him, all his weariness had passed, and his lightness of heart was ever greater than on that day when he had left the chapel of voices for his long quest. But as he wondered, he became aware of voices near him, and saw that children were playing in the garden about him. As he perceived them, they saw him too, and immediately left their play to come to him. They looked at him with eyes whose welcome was mingled with delight. See, 
said one. He has a shield, and it is a dented shield. He must have had great battles, save for a few children. Few come here without great battles, said another. And look at his hands. They took his hands and theirs. Yes, said one. Here are the marks. See? Ah, said another. But few come here without those marks. And then they took his marked hands and kissed them. And when he wondered, they said, We love such hands as these, for they bear the marks of a friend. When they spoke so kindly and did so lovingly, he had courage to speak to them. Tell me, he said, what city this may be, for I am a stranger and do not know. Then said a maiden who held Sir Constant by the hand, He does not know, and we may not tell him, for we did not come through the, that forest. But Radiance will tell him, for he came that way. Then came a boy and stood before them smiling. His face was bright as a fair morning and brighter for the deep shadows that lingered in his eyes. These are the shadows of the forest, said the maiden, but they are not the shadows of pain, for there is no pain here. They are but the memories that make his joy the greater and his praise a joy. It is these shadows that make his face so bright that we call him Radiant. Yes, said the, the boy called Radiant, but for the shadow of remembrance, how could we fitly praise the king for the glory of the star in the wonder of the face with this unutterable love? But know you not what city this is? How can I know? asked Constant. Last night here there was a forest, dark and toilsome, but now there is no forest, but a city. Truly, said Radiant, and it is the city of the great king. Our knight's heart leaped at the word, but then he was bemused by the sudden wonder of it, and said only, How may this be? A city royal lay far away from those eastern hills. And as the church fondled his scarred hands and smiled in his face, the boy called Radiant answered him, Aye, far away and ever far, till the heart grows weak and the will grows weary. Such is the lot for those who shun the king's way, which is through the forest of burdens. For that is the way which the Lord of the vision took, leaving light in every footprint for those who should come after, who should know so well the way to his father's house. Nay, sir, this also is said, though it is a mystery which we cannot measure that those who follow the vision through the forest of burdens may bring the city near so that its towers may shine today where yesterday the forest ways were dark and dreadful. By the power of the king and his grace, it is their feet that lay down its sunny paths in their hands that rear its pinnacles to the sky. Then, as Sir Constant stood in wonder, the boy looked beyond and smiled. I cannot tell you more, he said, for I do not know. I was not long in the forest, for it was too sore for me, and I came soon to the end. But here is one who shall tell you all. There was indeed another in the garden, walking towards them kindly in his look and so gentle in his manner that his gentleness veiled his kingliness. As a friend, he came smiling upon the children as he drew near, and some of them ran to him and clasped 
him eagerly and led him on. But as his hands touched them, they rested, joy taking the place of haste, and peace the heat of a child's desire. Then one said, This good night is come, and he bears your marks. But he did not know that he had reached the city. He stood with a smile of greeting. Constant trembled, but he could not fully know him, as though the eyes shrank from some great truth because the heart was not ready to receive it. It is true that I knew not, said Constant. Yesterday I was, I saw a, a great forest in no sign of such a city. Again he smiled. Nay, he said, this is the city of your seeking, the city of the great king. The voice had tones like the music of many waters, and the heart of Constant surged like the sea. He feared to look up, but as he stood with bowed head, he saw at his feet a bed of flowers. They were the star lilies, which he had seen in the gardens of the great king, the flowers immortal. Then he saw the hands of this man as the children fondled them, and they had scars upon them, old scars which ten thousand ages might not remove. When he saw these marks, he knew not what he said, but it was some word of his own unworthiness to enter the city royal. But he of the scarred hands answered gently, Your lack shall the king's grace make good, as it is with all other men. But surely he takes the right way to the city who sets his heart against the black knight and fights free from the wood of beasts defeats the enchantments of the gray questioner, and plants the flower immortal in the forest of burdens. So have you come, and here I name you comrade and brother. Then the knight took courage, and raised his eyes, and the veil was taken away, so that he knew who spoke to him. It was the king's son, who was the gardener, and it was the chief shepherd of the place of waters. It was his friend of the way of the carpenter, in the warden of the pass of tears, in the strong helper who had met him on the shore of the misty sea. But more than all, the face was the face of the vision in the chapel of voices, and the eyes were filled with that love which had ever been the star of his journey, now it unfolded him, as it had done on the night of his vigil in the chapel. And when he felt its power, the city was strange no longer, and he was at home, at rest. Come, said the voice, you have fought a good fight, you have finished your course, you have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for you a crown of righteousness, which my Father himself shall give you. Come, he has been waiting for you.